So today we're uh, continuing with our series called David, just simply David. And um, I know that uh, some of you have your Bible. If you have your Bible, uh, you can turn to 1 uh, Samuel. Uh, we'll, we'll be looking at a lot of different chapters, 18 through 22. We're not going to be reading through those. Some of you are like, oh my goodness, we're going to sit and read. All no, we're not going to read. I'm just going to kind of tell you uh, some st stories about David today and, and how it uh, kind of intertwines with our life. Um, but I want to say this as we jump into the message this morning, that we're going to come face to face uh, in this message with some things that are very relevant to us. And uh, here's what we're going to discover, that God's will for our lives does not look really good when we're angry, when we're isolated, or when we're afraid. When one of those things is happening to us, we look at God's will and we say, who wants to follow God? Who would even want to? When I'm ticked off, when I'm upset, when I'm alone, when I'm isolated, or when I'm filled with fear, that's kind of the last thing that I want to do. These three things have the potential to mess up the most committed Christian there is. In fact, I, I think they're so dangerous, I, I call them invisible giants, anger, isolation, and fear. And each one of those has the potential of pushing us, pushing us off of the edge, pushing us off of the moral road that, that we want to be on. It has the potential to slam us against the, 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 the guardrails that we've set up for our lives, those ethical boundaries that we've set up. Very dangerous. They can cause us to be a part of the greatest regrets of our lives. In fact, I'm sure that if we took some time this morning, many of you could come up here to this stage and share how you experienced the greatest regret of your life and how it stemmed really from one of those things. Either you were at a time in your life where you were super angry and you did something that you knew you shouldn't have done and now you're living with that regret. Or perhaps you were at a point in your life where you felt very lonely, very scared, very isolated, and you did something that you're regretting. Or you were filled with fear and you did something that was a major regret in your life. Has anyone ever been there before? Yeah. I, I think all of us really have, and if not, we, we will head down that road if we're not careful. But the thing is this, is that with those giants, with those invisible giants, there are emotions that come with that. And when those feelings of isolation and anger and fear, they come, there's something inside of us. It just compels us to do something. We've got to do something to relieve the tension that is inside of us. And the truth is, really, we'll do just about anything, right? Because we don't want to live with that. We don't want to have those feelings. We want to relieve those feelings. And it's almost like it's, it's a part of us. It's our, our instinct. And, and, and whatever we did last time to relieve it, we'll just do it again. Even though it was dangerous. Even though it was stupid. The problem is things never get better. They only get worse. It just compounds the regret in our life. And really, instead of alleviating the anger, we just get more angry. We get more upset, or we get more scared. Let's talk about David. David had two major failures in his life. He had a, a few other ones, but we know some major ones. There's two major ones. I think a lot of us were familiar with the one that happened when he was in his 50s. We know that story. In fact, that's the story of Bathsheba. You remember that story? A lot of us know that, and that's the reason why some of us, we love David so much, is because he fell, and, and, and he fell from grace, and God gave him a second chance, and, and we can associate with him. But there was another failure that took place in David's life, not in his 50s, but in his 20s. In fact, he was 22 years old when this failure took place. You see, after David killed Goliath, 
And we talked about that last week. By the way, if you were not here last week, I would encourage you to jump on our website and, and to, to view the, the message last week. But after he killed Goliath, he becomes the most important guy in all of Israel. He was so famous, and he was just 15 years old. Everybody loved David. They were making up songs about David. David was like a legend. And you know who the king was at the time, right? His name was King Saul. King Saul was super insecure, all right? He had some major issues. He would see David and how the people loved David and all of his popularity, and he became insecure about it. And it became very overwhelming to King Saul. So Saul came up with this plan. He's like, I got to figure out a way to control David because he's out of control. People are starting to like him more than they like me. And so he thought in his mind, if I could get him a part of my family, then I could control him. Then I could have him do what I want him to do. So he offers, the king offers one of his daughters to David and said, David, would you like to marry my daughter? And I love David's response to this. He says, I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy, king, to be your son-in-law. I'm not worthy to be a part of, of your royal family. I'm just a, a, humble, a humble guy here. I, I don't come from a rich family or a famous family. I could never marry into royalty. And the people caught wind of David's response, and they loved him even more because they saw that he was so humble. What an incredible guy he was. Well, time goes by, and Saul continues to look for opportunities where he could control David. And in the meantime, David falls in love with the other, one of the other daughters of King Saul. Her name was Michael, and they get married. David also becomes really, really good friends with King Saul's son. Do you know his name? Jonathan. They have such a great time together. Jonathan's such a cool guy. And all of this is happening. And King Saul is like, what in the world is happening? Wait a minute. And he thinks to himself, having David in, in, as a part of my family, maybe this wasn't such a great thing after all. You see, David starts to get more powerful. Everybody starts falling in love with David even more. And Saul becomes extremely jealous. And so for the next seven years, David goes, becomes uh, uh, um, so um, loved by the people. And, and Saul, he gets, uh, is like, it goes in and out of Saul's favor. And a few times Saul is like, you know what? I hate this kid. I got to get rid of this kid. And what he would do is he's like, I I'm going to send you, David, off to, to impossible missions. I'm going to send you out to the enemy. And so he would take the troops, and, and in Saul's mind, he's going to get defeated. He's going to get killed out in battle. But every time David would come back all victorious, and it just made everything worse for King Saul because the people would line the streets and sing about David and, and so excited that David had the victory. And Saul's like, you know what? I've had enough of this kid. I'm so mad at this kid. And he figures out that his own son, Jonathan, and his own daughter are telling David the things that King Saul is telling them in secret. They're going and they're warning David. And, 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 and he just gets so ticked off. King Saul is so upset. So he decides to have a dinner. And when the king has a dinner, it's a big deal, all right? So here's King Saul with all of his family, and, and David is not there. Family is gathered, and Saul, he goes absolutely nuts at the dinner table. The Bible tells us, it says Saul's anger flared up at Jonathan, okay, his son. And he says this to him, are you ready? He says, you son of a perverse and rebellious woman. How rude. He says, I know that you have sided with the son of Jesse, who was David, right? I mean, he's so angry. Saul has had it. He says, I'm just tired of pretending. I know you all hate me. 
all you around this table. I know you, you don't like me. I know you like David more than me. And here's the thing. I'm gonna, just going to say it, okay? I know that everyone sitting at this table hates me. So here's the thing. As long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, no one, none of you will have your kingdom established. He was saying this to his family. Saul is threatening his family, saying, you want to be rulers? You're not going to be. As long as David is alive, you're not going to be rulers. Because in his mind, in King Saul's mind, guess who was going to be king? Jonathan, his son. We all know the story that, that David was the anointed one by God that was going to be the second king of Israel. But Saul had gone nuts. And so he was so angry, he was so ticked off, he said, you know what? He said, send me someone to go and get David because I'm going to kill him. He's done. He stomps out of the room. Jonathan then runs out of the room as well, and he runs to David, and he says, David, you got to get out of here. You got to leave the country. My dad has gone completely crazy. He's going to kill you. He's not going to rest until you are dead. The king is threatened, David, by your reputation. The people love you, but he hates you. He wants you dead. Remember, guys, how old is David right now? He's 22 years old. Suddenly, all throughout his whole life, he's never been this afraid. He's suddenly now filled with fear because this is serious. He's going to be killed. And he didn't deserve any of this. He served King Saul. He did everything that he was supposed to do. And all of a sudden, and you know how it feels, right? When you're rejected. All those feelings of rejection start to come, start to pour over David's heart. And really, David didn't deserve it. So David's alone. He finds himself angry. He finds himself afraid. And all those emotions, they start messing with his heart. And it's like so, so weird. And David's never really felt like this before. And many of you, you know those feelings. You know what it means to be alone. You know what it means to be afraid. You know what it means to be angry. And all those emotions that pour into your heart, you probably would have done like David had done. You know what David did? David panicked. He panicked. David decided to do something. He decided to, to take matters in his own hands. And I want you to see what happens, okay? David lost sight in the fact that God was with him. He forgot it. Why? Because those invisible giants popped their head up and all the emotions associated with it, he had forgotten God. He had forgotten that God was with him. He had forgotten that he was the anointed of God. The text tells us that David went to Nob, N-O-B. He ran to a priest, the high priest. His name was Ahimelech. Just for a second, let me say this, that Jerusalem, the city of Jerusalem had not yet been established, okay? So Jerusalem, the, the center of worship had not yet been. So the center of worship was wherever the tabernacle was. And they would move the tabernacle along with the Ark of the Covenant, okay, to different places. And it just so happened to be in the village of Nob, N-O-B. And so David runs there. He goes to Ahimelech. And there he finds him, and, 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 and Ahimelech is like so freaked out that he sees David because usually when, when people see David, he's not by himself. He's with a whole entourage of soldiers and troops, and I'm talking thousands. I mean, David was an important guy. And here he stands before Ahimelech, the high priest, and Ahimelech's like, what in the world are you doing here by yourself? And Ahimelech, they never seen him alone. And so David says this to the priest. And this is, um, this is where things get really crazy. David lies. He lies. David knows. <laughs> he knows that what is coming out of his mouth, the next words that come out of his mouth, they're going to be not the truth. And in fact, he knows that the law of God says what? Thou shalt not 
lie. And remember last week we talked about what made David so unique out of any other king is that David loved the law. And guess what? The original Ten Commandments were just feet away from him. The original Ten Commandments. David loved the law, but he decided to lie. He decided to open up his mouth and speak untruth. Why is he doing that? Why is David lying? It's because David is afraid. Have you ever lied when you were afraid? Afraid of what might happen if you were to tell the truth? Afraid of the future? Afraid of the next step that would happen to you if you dared speak the truth? That's what happened to David. You see, when you're afraid or you're angry or you feel abandoned, you forget. You forget that God is even there. You forget the ways of God. And here's what David said to Ahimelech. He said this. Here's the lie. The king sent me on a mission and said to me, no one is to know anything about the mission that I'm sending you on. And my men are going to meet me later at a certain place. Now, that wasn't true. That was a super lame lie too, right? How many of you know that when you're scared, when you're afraid, and you open your mouth, and you start to lie, you know how, what your lie sounds like? It sounds really stupid. It sounds really lame. That's the case here. I think Ahimelech knew. But David was afraid. He was afraid to tell the priest the truth because he thought that the priest wouldn't help him if he spoke the truth. Well, that lie that David told, it had consequences to it. And we'll find out what those consequences were. But the story continues. David is so hungry. The guy's starving, all right? And, and he says, Ahimelech, I, I'm so hungry. I need some food. And Ahimelech is thinking, Gosh, this is so weird. David's here by himself. He's hungry. And he says to David, David, I don't, I don't have any ordinary bread to give you. I mean, I, all I've got really is the consecrated bread. Now, I'm not going to go into a complete detail about the consecrated bread, except that you need to know that basically it was a loaf of bread that was presented to, on the altar of God for God, and of course it was a symbol, and they would take that bread the next day, and the priest and his family would eat that bread only if they were ceremonially clean. So Ahimelech says, David, I, I guess you, you can eat the consecrated bread. And we think, what are you doing, David? Great, now you, you, you tell a lie, and now you're going to do something that you know is against God's ways. What is happening to you, David? Man, you're just spiraling down. Then something major happens. David asks Ahimelech, um, do you happen to have a sword? Do you have a spear? Do, do you have some kind of weapon that I can have? And Ahimelech is like, uh, I, I, I think so. Wait, wait a minute. Wait a second, you're the most famous person in all of Israel, and you're here by yourself. David, you look like trash. You look so tired. You look so exhausted. You don't have any food, and now you want a sword? Something's really weird here. Yeah, 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 I need a sword. Do you got a sword, a spear? Anything will do. And at this very moment, David realizes, what the heck am I doing? What am I doing right now? You see, I believe at that very moment, David's eyes were opened up. I want you to check this out. The priest said this, the sword of Goliath, the Philistine, that you killed seven years ago, that sword, that very sword, is right here. It's here. <laughs> Come on. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being David at that very moment? You see, the moment that, that David, when he was 15 years old, you remember the, the giant came down with a stone, the slingshot, the stone hit him, and, and he fell down, and he took Goliath's sword, right? You remember the story. He took Goliath's sword, and he killed Goliath. He cut his head off, right? He killed him. That sword meant something to David. 
He cleaned that sword up and he took it back to his tent and he kept it for a souvenir for a while, but then he made the decision, this sword means so much, I'm going to take it to the high priest and I'm going to dedicate it to God as a sign, as a symbol of God's power, of God's faithfulness to the people of Israel. The sword meant something to David. It meant something. It meant that God was faithful. Now, I want you to imagine all the emotion that when David saw that sword, he hadn't seen it for seven years, he saw that sword, and we think, David, what are you going to do? We think, what happened to the boy? What happened to the 15-year-old boy that was so filled with faith, who stood before the giant Goliath, who killed the bear, who killed the lion, who had so much confidence and faith in God? Where is that shepherd boy? You're 22 years old now. Don't you think you should have matured and become this man of God, this man of faith? What happened to that kid? You see, David was the kind of kid that, that wouldn't run away from danger. He would run toward danger. What happened to the poet? The poet that, that wrote the most famous words, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Where's that kid at? Where is he? Where's the faith? Where's the confidence in God? Well, let me tell you what happened. Those three invisible giants, fear, anger, loneliness, they came to visit David. Hey, they're the same three giants that visit you and me. They're the same three giants that, that bang on the doors of our heart as well. But when David was shown that visible reminder, that sword, that visible reminder, something tangible right in front of him of God's faithfulness, David misses it. And the priest said, if you want the sword, you can take it. You can have it. There's no other sword here but this sword. And even though it didn't make any sense to Ahimelech. David said, give it to me. Give me the sword. I'll take the sword. David takes matters in his own hands, and he runs. He's running. He ran away from King Saul. He's running away because he's afraid. And I, I, I want to break it down, and I want to talk about you and me for a minute, okay? Okay. You see, when we get to the point in our lives where we need God the most, many times we forget to lean upon God, that God has the answer, that God wants to guide us, God wants to show us. But so many times when we need God the most, we don't rely on Him. In fact, we tend to do the opposite, and we do like David. We run, which often leads us to a place that we wish we never had been, and that's where the regret comes. And the thing is this, guys, you've seen it. You've seen it in other people. You've seen it perhaps in your own children. You've seen it in, in people that aren't serving God, and you see them because they are experiencing those giants of, of fear and anger and isolation. You can see it so clearly. They're going down a path of destruction. They're getting involved in things that they shouldn't be involved in. You can see it. I can see it. We're not blind. We can see so clearly. And we say, why are you being so stupid? Can't you see that you're ruining your life? Can't you see that you're going to have so much regret if you go down this road? It's so easy for us to see it in other people, but we can't see it in ourselves. You know why that is? Because you and I know how to convince ourselves that our situation is different. Oh, Pastor Scott, my situation is so unique, so different. It's, it, it's not like anybody else, and that's what David thought too. He thought, and we tend to think, if God were with me, if, if God were really with me, 
then this wouldn't have happened in my life. Guys, listen. It's so easy for us to trust God when things are going well, when we have nothing to trust God for, nothing to trust Him with. I can remember as a teenager, as a young adult, being so on fire for God. I remember my Bible, spending so much time highlighting it, writing notes. I can remember trusting God and coming to an altar on a regular basis and at camp, youth camp, and just falling in love with God. I could trust God and believe God for anything. I had so much boldness. Maybe that's you. But you know what? It was easy back then because I didn't have a whole lot. I wasn't married. I didn't have any kids. My car was just a, you know, a car to get me by. Didn't have a decent job. You see, the point is it's easy to trust God when you have hardly anything to trust Him with and nothing to trust Him for. You see, when things are going great in your life, it's easy to sing worship songs. It's easy to serve God. It's easy to serve people. It's easy to pray over people. It's hard, though, to trust God when things we love and value start to slip away. So David, he takes this sword, Goliath's sword. He knows he's got to leave the country, and guess where he goes? David goes to the land of the Philistines, the enemy's territory. This is absolutely crazy. Guys, I did not make this up. This is in the Bible. He goes to the enemy's territory with Goliath's sword. And not only that, it says that he goes to the city of Gath. Do you recognize that? Goliath was from Gath. He goes to the very city of Goliath. And, and the reason why he's doing that is because he's not thinking straight. He's panicking. He's afraid. And he goes to the Philistine, Philistines, and he goes to the king, and he says, um, I want to join your army. The king's like, what? Are you nuts? Seriously, I, I want to I join your army. I, I want to fight against my own people. And the Philistines are like, you are absolutely crazy. There is no way. We know who you are. You're David. You are, you don't, don't try and fool us. You're David, and you're carrying, Gol we see it. You've got Goliath's sword. And all of a sudden, David is like, oh my goodness. All of his enemies are all around him. And you know what he does? He pretends to be insane. He goes crazy. I, I probably do the same thing. He starts scratching the wood with his nails, and he starts slobbering all over the place, spitting all over the place. And they're like, get that guy out of here. The king's all, get him out of here. He's crazy. He's a nutcase. So David flees. He leaves the Philistine region. Remember, David's 22 years old. David finds a cave, and he sets up camp for himself in the cave. Why is David in a cave? Because he's afraid. He is so filled with fear. He's so upset. He's so angry. And the Bible says that a little time went by and he came to his senses. David went back to his own country and he finds another prophet. And he goes to the prophet and he says, man, I've really messed up, prophet. I've made a complete mess of my life. I want to know God's will. I'm desperate for God's will. Will you pray with me? Will you seek the Lord on my behalf? I need the counsel of God. Well, unfortunately, the damage had been done. You remember that lie? You remember how it all started with Ahimelech? Well, there was another guy that was listening to that whole conversation when David and Ahimelech were talking. There was somebody else in the room hiding. This guy's name was Doag. I want to call him Doag the Dork, all right? Because Doag the Dork, basically, this guy got it all wrong. He got the whole story wrong. He was the chief herdsman for King Saul, and he went back to, to Saul, and he told him, he's like, you know what, when it happened, I was just, I, I heard the conversation, and I, and, and I, I went uh, and there, and I'm coming back to you, and I want to tell you that 
Man, they are in cahoots together. Ahimelech is aiding him, and they're siding against you, king. And remember, king, he's your enemy. You hate him. And Saul was so ticked off. He was so mad. He's all, how could anyone side with David? I hate David. And so he had his soldiers bring Ahimelech to him, along with all of his sons from his family, all the men from his family. And King Saul said to this high priest, he said, how could you conspire against me? How could you take the side of David, whom I hate? And Ahimelech is like, look, I don't know what's going on here, okay? Everybody's nuts around here. Everybody's crazy. I don't know what you're smoking here, king, but this is, you guys are, you guys are off your rocker. David is the most loyal person in your whole court. I mean, he, there was no one like David, King Saul. Everyone knew that he was the most loyal that there ever was. Basically, Ahimelech was saying, I don't know what you're talking about. But the king says, you are going to die, Ahimelech, along with your whole family. And so he has him killed. I'm telling you, King Saul was nuts. He was crazy. And then what he did was he said, said, guards, I want you to kill all the priests of the Lord. Because he was convinced that they too had sided with David. And the soldiers are like, wait a minute, King Saul, you are going a little bit too far here. We're not going to kill the anointed of God. We're not going to kill the priests of God. I mean, we'll kill a lot of people. We'll kill the enemy. We'll kill the people who have stolen from us and, and done bad things to us. But we are not touching the priests. And Doag the dork steps up and he says, well, I'll do it. What an idiot. And he grabs the sword and he starts slaughtering 85 priests that day. Saul continues with his madness, and he tells his army, go to Nob and kill everyone that's there, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl, every infant. Get rid of them all. Destroy them. Horrible. Absolutely horrible. Very few escaped that day, but there was one guy that escaped. It was Ahimelech's son. One of his sons happened to escape and he runs and he finds David and he throws himself on the ground in front of David and he said, David, and he tells him the whole story. And the Bible tells us that David's heart is broken. The Bible tells us that David says, I am responsible for the death of your entire family. And not only was he responsible for the entire, his whole family, but the whole village died because of David. You know, sometimes, guys, listen, sometimes it feels good to take matters in your own hands, doesn't it? Doesn't it feel good? But a lot of times, it just doesn't turn out so good. As we close, I want to just say that we all deal with this. Sometimes in our anger, that anger pushes us pushes us to do things that we shouldn't do or those feelings of isolation or feelings of alone. We, we sit there and we start to fantasize and think and we let our minds wander and we think, oh, if I could do this. Oh, I'll go down that road. I'll just go over here and I'll do this. And, and, and we know we have no business doing that, but we fantasize about it. We fantasize about things when we're fearful. We think to ourselves, you know, if I could just do this, I'll go there, and then I'll feel better about it. Listen, I want to tell you that those emotions that are associated with those three giants are extremely dangerous. Here's the question today. What is your loneliness, your anger, your fear, What are they causing you to consider in your life right now? What are they causing you to consider? Consider things that you've never thought that you'd ever do. Some sort of action that you're going to do something. You're contemplating. And some of you right now, you've come to church and you have been contemplating because you're so ticked off about a relationship. 
You're so ticked off. Maybe it's your spouse. Maybe it's another relationship. But you're so angry and your mind is just going crazy and you're thinking about doing something that you know you shouldn't do, but you're contemplating it. Some of you here today are so filled with fear. Fear about the future. Fear about something fear about your job, fear about your finances. And there's almost a desperation inside of your spirit, inside of your heart, and it's driving you. It's driving you crazy. It's driving you nuts. And you're thinking about things that, that you shouldn't think about. And, and you're, you're, you're going to want to do something to alleviate it. Maybe you're considering because you feel alone. Thinking that you should re embrace an old habit, an old habit that you spent so long trying to get rid of, but you've been contemplating. Maybe just one sip, maybe just one look, maybe if I just experiment down this road again, and what if I just do it? And and it took you so long to get rid of that habit. And you've been thinking because you're so isolated and you're so alone that it's driving you crazy. And you think, I've got to relieve it. That pain inside. I want to tell you today that your situation is not unique. Oh, you might think that it is. You might think, oh, Pastor Scott, you don't know my situation. You don't know the pain that I'm involved with. You don't know how angry I am. You don't know how scared I am. You don't know how alone I am. It's not a good feeling. I know, I get it. Listen, you are a special and unique person, but your situation is not unique. There have been people who have traveled down the same road that you have traveled on. Yes, same road that you have traveled on, and they have overcome. Your situation is not unique. I think if David were to give us some advice today, it would come from the book of Psalms. If you have your Bible, would you turn to just one scripture today? One verse. Psalm chapter 9, verse number 9. This is the advice, and, and, and this is the advice not from a 22-year-old David. This is the advice from an older David one who has been established. He wrote it for us here and he said, the Lord, the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. You know those feelings that you've been having, those emotions associated with those giants? They cause us, they, it's a sense of oppression. Some of you feel so oppressed today and you need to be reminded that the Lord is your refuge. The Lord is your refuge. If you are oppressed, it's not a chemical that's going to do it for you. It's not alcohol that's going to do it for you. Not an affair, not another person, not, to, not, not a lot of debt to accumulate a lot of debt. It's not getting a new car or a new house. The Lord is a refuge for those who are oppressed. And then it says that He, that God, is a stronghold in times of trouble. You know what a stronghold is? A stronghold is that place during wartime that you go to. It is that place of safety that you can run to. The Bible tells us that God is that stronghold. God is that safety. As we close today, I can't help but think that we've all been down that road. Some of you are in that the season right now with all those giants around you, or maybe one giant around you, and the emotions that you've been having, or perhaps it will happen in the future. We need to be reminded today that He alone is our refuge. Amen? Stand to your feet, will you? Today, before we go home, you say, Pastor, man, you, I don't know, you're reading my mail today. No, this is just the Word of God. Listen, you're here today and you say, Pastor, will you pray for me? Because 
I've been doing a lot of thinking. My thoughts haven't been really that good of thought. Thoughts. I've been contemplating things. Things that I shouldn't be contemplating. I've been making decisions about going down a road that I shouldn't go down. Crossing a guardrail that I shouldn't cross. If that's you today, would you just slip your hand in the air and say, Pastor, pray for me today. Pray for me. I've been ticked out of my mind. I got fear. I feel isolated. I feel alone. Come on. We're all family here. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of us. Yeah. Let's pray today. Let's pray. Lord, here we are. Lord, we use the excuse all the time. I'm only human. God, we make mistakes, we fall. God, you want us to run to you. Lord, when we're in times of trouble, when those invisible giants pop their heads up and start banging on the doors of our hearts, God, we call out to you. You alone are our stronghold. You are our safety. Help us know that you are faithful and that you are everything that we need. Help us to realize, God, when we are at the moment where we need you the most, God, that we would call upon you and not reject you, that we would not take matters in our own hands and find a quick solution to relieve the pain in our hearts. Lord, you be that. You be that refuge. You be that stronghold today. We commit ourselves to you. We ask, Lord, that you give us more confidence in you, more faith in you today. Help us to believe, God, that you can do all things and everything. Help us, Lord, to see beyond, Lord, the, the things in front of us. Help us, Lord, to see you high and lifted up. Help us to see that you can take care of all of our lonely problems, God, all of our anger issues all of our fear issues, God. We give them to you today. We want to follow you in your ways.